we're going to talk manufactured housing. You guys ready? All right. I'm going to share this screen again. Actually, I'm going to I'm going to pull up the. You know, I had someone the other who I was talking to. I went to dinner last night with Lisa and Jonathan Hitchcock, and they were talking about how someone they. What did the conversation was something about, well, I'm just going to go, oh, I know what it was. It's one of our mutual customers that's talking about selling her house in Denison. She just bought it less than two years ago. So it's like, hold up, hang on. You're going to have capital gains. Um, so be careful. It is her homestead. It's less than two years. and But she's going to sell her house and go buy a mobile home because she could save money. And Lisa was like, hang on, you bought your house a little less than two years ago but still you got a great interest rate and you think you're going to save money buying a manufactured home you obviously haven't looked at the pricing of manufactured homes and then you add what the interest rate is on um, a loan now versus you know a little less than two years ago and so the, it's just funny how people automatically associate manufactured home with cheap when that's not the case. In some cases, you get more home for the money, but it's on land. And typically the land has shop with it and all of the other things that adds to the cost of it all. So those, those days of finding cheap housing in a mobile home doesn't really exist, but that's what's in people's head. So they'll call you guys and go, hey, I'll just, I'll just find a manufactured home. Okay, how many acres, how many acres are you gonna want it on? Cause it's gonna come with acreage. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so what do you need to know to make sure you are prepared for that transaction? Oops. Again, I want to remind you a lot of what I'm going to pull up is on the michellecastle.info page under partner resource. So you'll know where to go to find. And then we'll send you over this too. See, if you go over here, and you scroll down, there is a right here is your manufactured home checklist. But there's some other resources that we'll will be sending out to you as well. Hey Michelle, share your screen. Yeah, I'm about to. I wanted to uh, oh, I didn't share that part with you guys. Y'all had a dollar for every time y'all said that. Y'all have lunch money after every one of these classes. Um, I just went to the partner resource tab, scroll down to affordable housing option manufactured homes. And Brandy, this is the checklist, but I think we've got even more now to add to that, don't we? Yeah. We need to update that with some more um, of the checklist, but we'll send them out to you also. Yeah, I was afraid of that. No, Michelle's not here. Oh, Brandy, I just said that to everybody. <laughs> no, she must be celebrating. She's drinking mimosas right now. Okay. I do not understand why that will not work for me on this. Sure. Yeah. Okay, so technically a manufactured home is built entirely in a factory, which is why it's more affordable. I mean, think about it. They don't have to worry about weather conditions. They don't have to worry about whether the subs 
do or don't show up or someone entice them to go to another job site for more money. They don't have to worry about building materials going up and down because they're buying them in bulk and they're buying for what they need. Um, they also, um, they also have limited floor plans. So they know exactly what they need from a material standpoint. Hang on, I've got to plug in my, my low battery light just popped up. Um, now, the reason that the, the reason that the age of the manufactured home matters so much is because HUD got involved in that whole building process in 1976 and put into existence some codes. And so that's why they care, that's why we care what year the home was built. Before that, there really wasn't any standards. It was just based on factory standards. So HUD came in and unified all of the standards that were um, required or the codes that were required for the manufactured homes. Um, even to the point of installation, you have to follow HUD code for installation. Which is why in a little bit, you'll, um, you'll see that um, when you're doing a HUD loan, which is FHA and VA, they're going to want to know that the home was installed in is steel uh, up to HUD codes, which is why you have to have an inspector come out, a structural engineer inspector on those homes to make sure that it still um, complies with the codes. And we'll talk more specifically about what those are so that you could be on the lookout whenever you're looking at these homes. Um, so a manufactured home could be up to three units, three sections. Now I've even seen them where they go up. So, you know, we're getting really good at engineering great floor plan options for people. Because not only, I mean, in this area, we've got plenty of land. In other parts of the country, you know, their lot sizes are a lot smaller than what we have. Um, all of them are going to have um, the steel beams in the, in the wheels, which is part of the transport of a manufactured home. And, um, and then, of, of course, there are some specifics, not just with the heating and the plumbing and the electrical and the HVAC, but also the energy efficiency of them. A lot of cases are a lot more, uh, th th those, those codes are more stringent. Well, now that we have IBC, the international business codes that the cities all follow, they should be all pretty aligned with each other. But in the past, you would have, you know, houses outside of the, the city, you wouldn't have code enforcement. And still you, I mean, if you were building a stick built home outside of the city limits, it's possible that the codes they were following for the county are less strict than a manufactured home because of the HUD codes that they were having to follow. Um, from a financing standpoint, it is really hard to find a bank in this area that will finance a manufactured home. They typically will finance it if it's a one of their bank customers that has plenty of money in the bank to cross pledge some collateral, maybe some cash in a CD or, or whatever, because they really are not wanting to collateralize the actual manufactured home. So the financing options you need to know whenever you're listing those homes or selling the home, in most cases, their options are gonna be cash, conventional. USDA is now available for manufactured homes, FHA and VA. There are credit score requirements. You know, we can go down to a 540 credit score on a regular house, but on a manufactured home, we're gonna be limited at 600. We can go down to a 620 on a conventional loan and um, this is all on doubles. Single wides, we require a higher credit score and that's a 620. There are very few lenders in this area. I, I, I'm not even sure who else does manufactured homes anymore in our area. You guys are really limited on manufactured financing. Um, the engineer's report, 
is going to be required on all FHA loans. It may be required on VA if the veteran, if the, if the appraiser doesn't make a specific comment on those reports. The reason that that's important is because, I mean, that, like we talked, a lot of people are short cash. This is another $550 report that the buyer is going to have to pay up front because the structural engineer wants to be paid up front. We'll order it, <clears throat> but they're going to have to pay for it. Um, if we're working with the title company that we trust, then we will allow a transaction where the manufactured home is not real property yet, it's chattel. So when a manufactured home is delivered on site to a property, it has a title and it is considered personal property. And it stays that way until somebody goes through the process to surrender the title to the state through the Texas Department of, uh, is TDHCA, Texas Department of Housing and Community Affairs. And it's a lengthy process and it takes a lot of paperwork. And so a lot of people don't do that process, especially if they already own the land. They'll just continue to keep it as personal property. And then they decide to sell it. So the one thing you wanna know, if you are listing that property, you need to look up on the tax records and see if it has um, been, if it's still taxed as real property or personal property, because that matters. They don't think to ask that question. Yeah. We don't know. Yeah. 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 No, most people do not know if it they're if they're if it's chattel, personal property, or if it's real property. Yes, ma'am, Kami. Can you file the two? Texas Department of Housing, Community, Housing and Community Affairs, TDHCA. And I'm gonna share you, with you guys the website in a few minutes because you need it. <clears throat> now, there are down payment assistance programs that will work with manufactured homes, so that's the good news. So not only can you do an FHA, VA, or USDA, but you can put a manufactured, I mean, you can put a grant or a DPA with that. There's a difference in a grant and a DPA. We won't go into that today. Um, the reason that it's, we're very particular about what title company we will close a transaction with where the manufactured home is personal property at the time that we're closing is because we're having to trust that the paperwork will get processed as quickly as possible by that title company to convert it with the cooperation of the seller and the buyer. And if that paperwork's not done right and it doesn't get filed quickly, now all of a sudden I have a loan on my books that I'm paying for. <clears throat> we just had one the other day that we finally got off of our books We've been fighting it for three years with an, with an Oklahoma title company and thought we were going to have to, 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 to default to uh, foreclose on the property because we couldn't get cooperation to get it, get it satisfied. I won't do that again. So we'll be extremely particular about who we allow and trust for those transactions. Um, but do know that we do allow them. I don't know anybody else that will allow those, um, but it's a big trust. <clears throat> um, the other reason that this is important, whether you know if it's real property or personal property, is because whenever you guys are writing the contract, remember, your person's only been paying taxes on that property as personal property. So the taxes haven't been the same as what they would be if it was real real estate, real property attached. So the prorations from the seller in order to get it converted from personal property to real property is gonna require taxes paid from the seller for the entire portion of the year they owned it as if it was real property. Otherwise, the buyer is gonna be responsible for that entire year of the tax difference between personal and real. And it's a lot of money. 
So if the contract's not negotiated right, you guys are going to have some really upset buyers and sellers that are jumping up and down because I got off life. They got, they got paid as if it was real estate, but it got taxed as if it was personal property, and that's very unfair. So um, that's another reason you got to pay attention to that. Now, there's a, the, the, the website that you're going to want, and we'll be sure to put that link in your notes, is the, it's just, H, it, you just go to tdhca.state.tx.us. Save it as a favorite if you're going to be showing real property, because you're going to run across manufactured homes. <clears throat> okay, when you go to that website, uh, well, you're also going to want to flag Grayson County Appraisal District's website because you're going to want to, number one, you're going to need the tag numbers off of the Grayson County Appraisal website because when you go to search the ownership records, you're going to need the tag number and the tag number is going to be on the website, <clears throat> the appraisal website. So number one, you need to search the ownership records and see if the manufactured home is in the same name as the as, as being taxed. You're going to want to look at the appraisal district to see if it's taxed as real estate or personal. And then you're going to need the tag number so that you can look further into where that home was ever was where it was first located and where it's been moved from into. So that's why that tag number is so important. So you'll see whenever you're looking it up, you're gonna put it by the, the light, it's, it's the label or the seal. You'll look it up that way because it's a lot easier to look it up that way than it is by name. I mean, you'll search for pages and pages on names. Okay. Once you do find the <clears throat> records, oops, you'll see all of the information. It'll show you um the the current owner versus who they bought it from versus who owned it prior to that okay and it's going to show you the square footage and the and and all of the other information the data cell and the certificates you'll even get to see how long it set from the time it was manufactured uh, or the year it was manufactured all of that information is going to be on this certificate Further down on the certificate, you're even going to see who the make and model was, or the, who the make was. Okay. <clears throat> Gosh, you get some hot water. Yeah. yeah. What was my one and sign on that? But that's the question that I asked because I knew they had inherited that property. Mm -hmm. They inherited from my grandfather. Oh, the they, the hate yes, and we're seeing that a lot right now. So people have, you know, say they bought a lot of acreage at one time, and now their kids, because of affordability, they're deeding out part of the property to the kids, and the kids are now putting a mobile home on it. And so <clears throat> then the kids decide they can't live that close to mom and dad, or they can't live that far out of town, or whatever it is, and they want to sell family problems. They want to sell. <clears throat> and it was never tied together. So uh, we are seeing more and more of that. Now, the, uh, the other thing that's really important is in, those, in that scenario, we have a lot of people, too, that will buy a house when you, with a manufactured home on it with the intentions to build a house to replace that mobile home later and then sell that mobile home. Not so easy if you have a mortgage loan because we did a mortgage loan on that mobile home tied to the land. So you can't just decide, hey, I'm going to build a house and move this off unless you pay us off. If you pay us off, then you can do that. But a lot of times you can't borrow enough money to build a house and pay off a mortgage loan that was on a house and land. If it was just a mortgage, you know, a, a bank loan on the land and not a house, then you might have enough equity there that you could do that. But a lot of people have this idea that they're just gonna buy a house with a manufactured home, build a home, move the home off. No, you're not, not if you're gonna buy, build, uh, borrow the money. 
So number one, know that conversation because I had a realtor the other day that thought it was just as easy as that. Buy a home mobile with a mobile home, move the mobile home off, build a house without considering that you got to pay off the loan that you that you got for the mobile home on that land attached. So, um, but there are used mobile homes that people will buy and they'll go put on land that was given to them by their family. And that is okay as long as when they go, it is until they go to sell the house, then it's a problem because it was a used mobile home set up on that land. And so in that case, if you're listing a house or showing a house and the home is not brand, was not brand new when it was set up on that site, the only loan program available is VA. Because VA is the only one that doesn't care. Now we've gotten by on a couple of FHAs because we couldn't prove otherwise. But I wouldn't use that as a, you know, it's gonna work for every transaction. So what you'll find whenever you go to, after you look at the home ownership records, you got to look at the installation records. Where was it installed? And does the addresses match? So it is another, um, it, it's just another tab on that same website that you're going to look at the installation records. In our county, we went through address changing. So if this manufactured home was placed on this site 20 years ago, it's possible that 911 changed the address. And so our first question is often, you know, does the seller say this home was has always been there or was it used? If they're adamant, yes, we bought it brand new from the dealership, it's always been on this site, but the address doesn't match. We will have them help us find the records that shows the 911 address change. We'll also call TCOG and get them to pull the records for us. But <clears throat> we do have to do all of that work and document it. So if you're about to list a house, you need to do this prior to, because there's no reason to slow the process down and allow people to think about how something might not have been done right. And now this is maybe a sign they shouldn't buy the house. Just keep it smooth and easy and do your homework. Um, so I had, we had it built in here where you could actually pull one up at the same time, but I'm just going to show you the screens. So if you were to pull up this address um, on the appraisal district website, you would, you would see right here, I see there's HUD, two HUD labels. That means it's a double wipe because each unit will have its own HUD label. There'll be like, you know, the last three is 744 and 745 because they're labeling them off the, as they're coming off the assembly line. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, just pull one of these two numbers. It doesn't matter which one. And then you're going to go to the TDHCA website. And you're going to put that label number in and look at the ownership records, right? After you look at the ownership records and you do your research and you're, you're, you know, making sure that the names all match, you can look at the deed history on the tax records and see if it lines up with the, with the history, the ownership history on TDHCA. Just look at all of that. And then you're going to want to go to the installation records and see if it's on its original site. Um, now, if there is not a serial number listed on the website, then you can go in there and start searching um, by, uh, by other information. The label numbers that are on the website, you have got to have the labels on the home. So the other thing that you've got to ask when you're listing the house, it, go ahead and get a picture of the labels and know where they are. Because if an appraiser goes out and they can't find the labels for whatever reason, you can say, oh, I know exactly where they are. They're under the sink or they're on the back of the property. 
the HUD labels are on the, they should be on the property. They were on there during installation and they still have to be. Now there are times that people will remodel. They'll put hardy board over the, the exterior or they'll gut the kitchen and they'll remove the labels. What do you do? We literally have to get new labels from TDHCA before we can close the transaction. It takes several weeks to rush it, cost a hundred and something dollars, and it slows the process down. So that's why it's really important when you're listing the house to get a copy of the HUD label so you know they were there. I, or yes, usually they're close to the tongue. All right. <clears throat> So then there's a website. So here, here's a good, and you'll get these handouts, but here's a good numbers just to keep handy for you. Put in a file for manufactured homes because this is the installation information. So if you know that the labels are missing, um, you, can, you can use this uh, department with TDHCA for new labels. You can also check on installation records if things aren't making sense. Uh, 911 address changes, those are going to get ta uh, take place at TCOC. <clears throat> now, the easiest thing for you guys to do when you're going to show or list a manufactured home is to shoot us an email with the address and we'll do all this work for you. But we're still going to send back to you all of the requirements that you're gonna to need to check out for us because I'm not going out to the property. We'll do the desk work, you guys go do the field work. Um, <clears throat> so some of the requirements for manufactured home you need to be aware of is again, there's credit score limitations. So this is not for your marginal customers. Uh, manufactured homes have to be built after June 15th of 76 because that's when the HUD code went into effect. It cannot be in a VFW or mobile home park because it can't be tied to the property. Um, any additions or structural changes to the home? So if they've added a carport, they've added a roof, I mean, uh, added a porch. Um, all of that will require a structural engineer's, or they've added a room. It'll require a structural engineer's report because we got to make sure that that tying into that structure did not compromise the integrity of the original structure. Because remember, these manufactured homes weren't built with the same materials that modern uh, are modern materials, and so they may not have tied it in well, and they may actually have some separation going on. And we have to prove that that's not the case. Um, so if you do pull up to a property, and most of these manufactured homes do have structural uh, additions, just know that it is very possible that we're going to need a structural engineer's report. So go ahead and prepare people for that. And they cost 550 bucks. And tell us, because it's better for us to address that up front than it is to wait till the appraisal comes in. You know, if I were listing the property, I'd go ahead and get it done at the listing. There's a lot of stuff that I would I would get done at the listing side of things. But the question is, sometimes our sellers don't have the money either. So then what? So, I mean, yeah, I'd have it on the checklist for them to be looking at. Um, uh, and you got to make sure if it's inside of the city limits or if there's... Uh, uh, permits required for that sort of thing, you better make sure you got the permits for the, for the work that's been done. A lot of times people outside of the county are doing things without permits. That's one of the beauty of being outside of the county, but they may have done some things that really required a permit and they just slid by. So just make sure you don't have any of those issues. And then the home was transported directly from the manufacturer dealership to the actual site. You're going to be looking at the um, the installation records for that, and you're also going to, we're also going to be looking to make sure it's permanently tied to the foundation. Now, some of the things visually you need to look at, the crawl space cannot be left open. There has to be skirting that is not wood destroying 
um, material like wood. It needs to be a hardy or you know something that's used for skirting. Um, the other thing that you need to be the wheels, tongues, and the axles will have to be removed, which is always I I don't I can't even remember a time where that's not been the case. It's been a I mean years and years and years. Yeah, at the VFW, but we wouldn't be financing them anyway. Um, <clears throat> sometimes you'll see one in disrepair and the AC unit is no longer working and they've got window units, but if it's got an HVAC system, you're going to have to have that HVAC system working because you've got ducting and you've got all of that that could be a health and safety issue because now you've got, you know, you've got a highway for rodents that's not being used. Um, how, what are some other scenarios, Brandy? to visually look for when you're listing or selling or showing. I think we've covered most everything. Yeah, just make sure your roof lines too. You know, a lot of times they'll add a porch on, but they don't do the roof lines really well. So just be mindful of that and the inspection's gonna cover that. Um, uh, Michelle, a couple of things. Um, <laughs> if they do that on a deck or something, don't you have to have an engineer come out and see if they've compromised, if they attach to, to the house, if they've compromised the integrity of the yep. home. And also, uh, uh, did you mention about how uh, the tie downs, if they're hurricane rated or anything like that? Yes, the tie downs. Um, yes, if you have a deck, you're going to need to um, prove that the deck didn't compromise the structural integrity, which would require most of the time a structural engineer, sometimes you can get the inspector to address it. Depends on the loan program. HUD's going to require a structural engineer anyway. Uh, the other thing that we see is sometimes someone had a structural engineer's report when they bought it three years ago and it was a HUD inspector. You got to have a new one. And that's a question that we get asked a lot. Uh, the tie downs do have to be adequate for the area. Um, my husband just went through all of the education and training for having a manufactured home license. And I was watching, oh my gosh, they would show all, it's like driver's ed where they're showing all the videos of the, if you don't tie it down correctly and high winds come um, type of videos. So that is the, the structural engineer is going to be checking that. But remember, if this is a conventional loan, there's not gonna be a structural engineer. And it's really hard for you as a layman to determine whether or not the tie downs are right for this area. They also have to be below the freeze line and the freeze line is different in different parts of the state. So um, all of that does need to be taken into account whenever uh, people are looking at manufactured homes. Yeah. Do you know what the freeze line is for this area? I don't, I'm not be able to ask my husband and he might even remember. Okay. But if not, um, yeah, no, I don't, I don't remember how many feet. I can't remember if it was 18 or 24 inches. It's something like that. Okay. So it's not just like, too far down. Mm -mm, no, no, it's not like drilling a well. Um, single wides, there are stricter guidelines on a single wide. It does need to be built before 2001. Um, it does have to be a... Um... Brandy, I was thinking on those, we couldn't... Can we do those if they're not titled? as real estate, can we do a conversion on that? I think we can. I don't know why it'd be any different because we're still in-house servicing that. I don't see it. I think it as long as there's no grants that are um, involved, okay. we're fine on that. Okay, all right. Um, now on a single wide, if there's a septic or well, we are gonna have to have the certification on that. Um, so. But you know what, if you're, if you're on septic, you're gonna have to get that pretty much anyway, because you gotta get the transfer and all of that other stuff, the registration. Um, a single wide, I don't even think double wides can be in a flood zone, which makes total sense. Then it'd be a floating home. Uh, the other thing that was different is off on a private road, uh, you got to have all acts, uh, all weather access and recorded easement for ingress and egress. But you know what? You pretty much need that on all transactions too. So 
again, there's checklists for all of this stuff. And the easiest thing for you to do is just send us the address so we can look everything up for you. And then if it's not right, you can blame it on us. It looks like there is a three line map. Oh, good. There you go. So we're somewhere between 10 and 20 feet. Yeah, but no, with, no inches. inches. That's what I was going to no, say. Yeah, inches. yeah. I knew it wasn't that. I, went, I knew it yeah. wasn't that, you know, when I was watching him do that part of the training. Yeah. Yeah. Is, yeah. Is, 10 to 20 inches is the freeze line in our area. So, all right. Well, those of you guys who, who are here for CE, um, we have you guys online registered. Everybody in the room needs to sign in on the sheet. For those of you guys here for the first part of the class, sign in at the, at the top, draw a line, and then sign in again on, as a second section. So we give you credit for both the classes that you were here for. And then who in this room was here for CE so I can give you the CE survey? Okay, cool. All right. Anybody, do you guys have more questions online? Ben, do you have any questions? No? Danny, any more questions? Oh, I'm good right now. Okay. We like those manufactured homes, so bring them to us. Really, the pricing and even, I think there's, what, a quarter of a percent pricing difference, uh, not in rate, just in cost. So it's it's really not that big a deal. I have a question. How do you recommend people go about, like, I've had this come up a couple of times, but it's come up before just recently about um, oh, that's a good question. So Jennifer Knott was asking on uh, new manufactured homes. Um, technically, we can finance those. The problem is you have to have someone, you, ha you have to have a banker in the middle that will pay for the home to leave the dealership and get set up on land so that we can do a mortgage loan. So a lot of times that's why the manufactured home dealerships have a partnership program with a mortgage lender who also has bank financing for that or investors that have pooled money. They're going to pay a higher rate of interest because of um, the real scenario competition. Um, I have talked to bankers over and over and over trying to get them to release funds for this so that we could give people more affordable, flexible options. I haven't succeeded yet. Um, but that's the only thing that keeps us from being able to do that is, is getting the home from the dealership set up. And that's why they're stuck with their the, the manufactured home dealership financing. And that would be, and, and the manufactured home dealership no, they're do, oh, they can do them as FHA and stuff. Oh, they can? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. They just charge them a lot more money than what we would if we were doing them. So, all right. But that's, that's a good question. And it, and it really is. Um, if I had Ben's money, then I would just, you know, we would just have a, yeah, we'd have a housing development with manufactured homes and we just sell, sell, sell. Let's go, darling. Okay, let's let's do it. Yeah, we're also. I'm serious. Well, so yeah. Houses right. Exactly. So. Yep. And there, I mean, we're we see quite a few resales. It's just um, the resales sometimes are more money just because the shop and the the amenities that are already there. But you know what? Most people want all of that stuff, but can they afford it? <clears throat> We did a we did a manufactured home loan. Um, it was, was several years ago, and it was like four almost five hundred thousand dollars for this manufactured home on land. But you know, and it wasn't even a lot of land, no. But it was all of the extras. You know, it was just a really nice shop and really nice fencing, and um, not a big horse facility, but enough of a horse facility. Oh, yeah. So uh huh. Yep. So anyway. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it was it was a guy that bought it, and he was he was loving it because it was all a guy, you know, it's all manly stuff. 
Yeah. All right. Well, thank you all for coming. Um,